sessione. Ci accomodiamo così iniziamo la sessione pomeridiana. Allora riprendiamo questo pomeriggio e a tenerci svegli dopo il pranzo, l'autopranzo fiorentino abbiamo chiesto a Giovanni Cresci di parlarci della Magnum Survey. Grazie mille. Vado così? Ok, thanks a lot. So the, the idea of this talk is to convince you to stay here at the conference also tomorrow morning. So I'm just introducing a, a series of talks that will be, uh, will be online tomorrow morning. So let's see if I succeed in this task. So let's start from the very beginning. So the, this plot is showing the a, a galaxy formation efficiency, the, the stellar mass in galaxies uh, um, divided by the halo mass of, the, of a galaxy as a function of their halo mass. And you see that the, there is that the, the baryon fraction locked in galaxies uh, decreases at low mass, where we think that the stellar feedback is dominating, and at high mass, but then the computer got stuck, so we don't know what happened at high mass. But in the high mass, we think that the effect of the AGN is, is dominating. However, this is uh, used in all the models to explain uh, observations like these ones, but still we lack the smoking gun of the effect of feedback on the host galaxies. Then I don't know how to go ahead because it's stuck. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Uh, so the, the idea is to go and observe feedback at high ratios where we you know there is the peak epoch of the feedback in the universe. But this is not an easy task. This is uh, my favorite source where you see a very collimated and extended uh, outflow in the oxygen tree wing uh, that is anti-correlated with the star formation in those galaxies. And this could be uh, one of the few examples of feedback in action at high redshift. However, despite a very few um, very nice example, usually it's Very it's very difficult to uh, uh, measure the properties of the outflows and understand uh, which are the mechanisms on which the, the outflows and feedback uh, works on the host galaxy. So the idea is to, instead of going at high redshift, is to study in detail nearby sources where you can reach a much higher resolution, you can get much more details. Uh, so we thought this was a, a great idea, uh, but then we realized that we are moving from the frying pan into the fire because, uh, I mean, we went for the high ratio where the signal to noise is very low and you can say whatever you want. And then in the local universe, you see a super complex uh, um, situation and it's hard to understand what's really going on in this galaxy. Anyhow, we use Muse. Muse is a, a well-known instrument. It was built actually to, to observe very faint uh, line emitters high redshift and turned out to be an exceptional machine to study nearby galaxy. Uh, so the Magnum Sarv is measuring active galactic nuclei under Muse microscope. Uh, the PI is Alessandro Marconi, is our Magnum PI. It, 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 till now we have observed uh, 10 objects. Um, all ne very nearby sources and very well known uh, with a plethora of multi-wavelength data available to, to compare with the MUSE data. Uh, the, the fact that they are so close uh, means that the, the, the spatial resolution, even with the single limited observation, is between uh, 15 and 100 parsec. So you can really go and understand the details of uh, in the interaction between the AGN and the host galaxy. 
So this is just one of these examples. This is NGC 1365, uh, the Great Barrett Galaxy. This is the MUSE data of this object in the, the nuclear region, where you see that the oxygen tree is dominating in the, outflow, in the cones, uh, the ionization cone of the galaxy, and H alpha is tracing the disk. Uh, if you subtract the oxygen tree velocity with, from the stellar velocity, what you get is a very nice uh, beaconical outflow with the blue shifted and the red shifted region. Uh, the, same, the same view you can get from the velocity dispersion that is much higher the location of the outflow. With, such da with this kind of data you can go much farther than the integrated mass outflow rate you can do in RH resources and you can go and resolve the outflow rate across the, the, uh, the outflow extension. So we divided, this is a work by Giacomo Venturi a few years ago, you can divide the, the outflow in small regions, uh, both in the blue shift and the red shift region of the, of the outflow and then you can compute the mass outflow rate and see how this outflow rate uh, changes with distance from the central region. Uh, interestingly, in the central part, uh, the outflow rate is comparable with what you get from the X-ray wind, uh, while it's decreasing at high, higher distance. This is probably an indication that the AGN activity is now increasing uh, in recent time with respect to what was uh, in, the, in the previous, uh, in previous times. Then we have other objects, this is Circinus. Uh, you see that the, the kinematical structure in the outflowing cone is very complex with blue shifted and red shifted regions. These are channel maps at uh, different velocities where you see these clumps in the oxygen tree emission that are moving away in the, in the outflow. This is another, sorry, this is another example, NGC 4945, where this is, this is the flux map in the nitrogen 2 that is tracing uh, the ionization cone. This is the velocity map, again a very complex. Uh, this is the disk of the galaxy, red and blue with the galaxy rotating in this direction, and the outflowing cone, uh, blue shift and red shifted, and traced also by the velocity dispersion. As you can see, the velocity field are, are very complex, so it's not so easy to model in detail the, the dynamics. Uh, so it, it, it's not clear if the, this, all these clumpy appearances is due to the fact that the, the emotions are, are, um, are complex and not uh, smooth, or it's just due to the clumpy uh, nature of the gas uh, in outflow. So the idea is to uh, build a new generation kinematical model, taking into account the fact that the medium is clumpy. Uh, so what we, what we did uh, is to um, uh, build a, a cloud model with, a, with a, uh, taking random uh, clouds across the field of view, uh, taking into account all the projection effect, uh, observation effects such as beam smearing and so on, and then um, assign, assuming a smooth uh, uh, velocity model and then assign uh, to each of these random clouds uh, a weight um, uh, based on the flux in each pixel where the, this cloud is observed at its velocity. Uh, the, in this way, you have a very versatile uh, tool that you can use to compare with, with the data. This is, will uh, be explained much better than what I did in Cosmos talk tomorrow. Uh, this is the first uh, announcement. Uh, and but just to show you that this, can really, this is the observed velocity field in 40 49.45, this is the model you assume, and then uh, with the, using the, this, uh, this uh, discrete model, you can perfectly reproduce what you are observing. So this is very exciting. Uh, then we had the, an ALMA follow-up of the, our manual sources. Uh, the, we have 15 targets of observed with ALMA. The PI are Stefano Carniani and Giacomo Venturi. Um, we observe CO322 uh, with both the 12 meters, uh, ACA and single dish observations. And this is fundamental also to recover, uh, to have a, a complete coverage also, including the short baselines that are fundamental in such bright and nearby sources. This is just an highlight from Stefano's talk tomorrow morning again. Uh, where we detect in, in 4945, as shown you before, uh, this, uh, uh, this is the in gray, the, this is the, the ionized alpha that I shown you before for Muse. Uh, the black uh, contour, the black points here are the uh, molecular outflow, and this is uh, the map in, in, uh, of the velocity and the velocity dispersion of the outflowing uh, molecular gas. And you see uh, that the, this kind of strange kinematics explain if you assume that the outflow is not only moving away from the center, but it's also still rotating uh, uh, in, in, together with the galaxy where it's coming from. So Stefan, again, will explain everything tomorrow. 
Uh, then w w another game you can play with this kind of data is to, uh, to compare the ISN condition in the outflow and in the disk of the galaxy. And to do this you can use the uh, kinematical information from Muse to distinguish the, the gas at rest uh, in the disk that, is, that has a velocity comparable with the stellar velocity in x pixel with the outflow that instead has a velocity much different from the, from the stellar velocity one. If you, do, uh, if you do this game you can co compare uh, the the basic properties of the ISM between the disk and the outflow, and you find that the, um, that the extinction is, uh, is slightly smaller in the, in the outflow, uh, the density is slightly higher in the outflow, uh, and the, uh, the ionization, as expected, is much higher in the outflow region inside the ionization cone. Interestingly enough, the, the, the densities we get, the derive in these nearby sievers are not so high, but once you average uh, using a luminosity weighted uh, um, average, you get a much higher value because the brightest spots are also the most dense. And then you get a value that is comparable with what is measured at high redshift. So probably doing a luminosity weight with the high redshift data, you are just picking up the highest density peak in the, in the outflow distribution. Uh, then you can compute, the, you can plot the uh, BPT diagrams uh, for the, the outflow only spaxel. This is an example from the Circinus galaxies. And what you get is that the, the external part of the ionization cone are the ones where the N2 over H alpha line ratio is higher. So this is an indication that the shock excitation is dominating in the central part of the outflow. Instead, the central part of the outflow has a much lower N2 over H alpha line ratio and a much higher ionization parameters as derived from the S3 over S2 line ratio. And this is an indication that probably at the center of the outflow, uh, the, the clouds are matter bounded and this explains the deficiency in the lower ionization line. Uh, then uh, we, can, we also study the impact of these outflows on those galaxies. This is an old example uh, back to five, more than five years ago in one of the galaxies 5643 where we detect these blue star forming clumps with very young ages uh, in the central part of the galaxy dominated by the AGN cone uh, and we found that these clumps are in the direction of the, uh, of the outflow at the center of the galaxy. The outflow is also traced by a radio and an X-ray uh, um, jet. Uh, so the, our interpretation is that the, 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 the outflow coming out from the, from, the, from the central region are hitting the, the dense material along the dust lane of, of the bar of this galaxy and is uh, triggering star formation in this region. However, the, the, the jet in these galaxies, especially in the, in the examples in our sample where we have a, a low luminosity radio jet that is inclined into the plane of the galaxy is not only triggering star formation, but it's also inducing a lot of turbulence in the host galaxy. Uh, these are a couple of examples from, uh, from our sample, again, NGC uh, 5643 and IC 5063, where there is this uh, low luminosity radio jets. What, what, what we found is that perpendicularly, in direction perpendicular to the radio jet, we see these regions of very high uh, line ratio and very high velocity dispersion of the gas that is probably tracing the turbulence induced by the jet into the, into the ISM and this could be uh, a, a kind of, uh, of feedback due to induced turbulence in the ISM. And again, Giacomo tomorrow will explain uh, you better all these things, also showing other examples of this. So my last minute about the future. So as you know, JWST is, uh, is, is uh, soon, in a few weeks, we'll start taking the first scientific data. This is a simulation of what you can do at Redshift 6 with the JWST. This is opening up uh, a full new window at high Redshift to the, the, such uh, specially resolved studies of AGN outflows and feedback. Uh, to, um, and also making possible also to study not only the ionized phase, but also the warm molecular uh, phase through the H2 transition in the near infrared. Uh, then there are other ground-based instruments, uh, integral field spectrometer. One is ARIS that is working in the near infrared that is now being commissioned and will be available at the end of the year. That is the, basically the improved version of Symphony with much higher sensitivity, stress ratio and sky coverage. And finally we will have in a few years MAVIS that is a multi-conjugate AO assisted uh, spectrograph and imager in the optical. So it will be a machine that is able to produce
produce HST-like images from the ground, as well as integral field spectroscopy. Uh, so again, this, all these, uh, these, these uh, uh, facilities will be complementary to one another because they will uh, cover the full uh, uh, AGN history uh, across the universe, from the local universe with Mavis from the, to the very high ratio of the GWST. And now my time is finished. This is my conclusion. And thanks a lot, and please stay tomorrow for the talk. Thanks for uh, the nice talk. I was wondering what are, because I, I think uh, you always showed uh, um, distances in uh, angular uh, sides. What are the typical um, physical size of these outflow that you can image at low redshift? And, and, and the related question, if you want, is I didn't see any clear trend of, uh, of uh, a, a gradient, a derivative of the velocity from inward to outward in any of the two directions, either positive or negative. Can you confirm this? Okay, so the, the velocity itself, I mean, it's, uh, the velocity field is usually very complex. Somehow you see, I mean, in the blue part of the cone, uh, um, you also see some redshifted uh, emission. So this is probably tracing the fact that, the, I mean, the, uh, along your line of sight, uh, given the large aperture of the cone, you have both... Uh, stuff that is moving towards you and also stuff that is moving away from you. But then uh, it, uh, the velocity pattern is not so, I mean, there is no clear velocity difference a, a bit, but, then, the, the main, but then you can measure difference in the mass outflow rate because the density, the flux is different, so you, you, you get these different trends with distance in the... Hey, no, not in, no, it's not clear in terms of velocity, but maybe Cosimo will, I mean, you see something in some galaxies, Cosimo will discuss this tomorrow. Uh, but then uh, on top of this, you, you, you will see much clearer the effect on the mass outflow rate. And the other question I forgot already. Oh, the size. Ah, the size. So basically, uh, one arc second is uh, around uh, 40 parsec, and, uh, and the radius of our data is 30 seconds. So you use something around uh, hundreds of parsecs. Sorry. No, no, no. They, they want the cap, so they are allowed to make a lot of questions. But anyway, there's tomorrow talk to us. Yeah, in fact, you don't ask, have to ask me, you have to ask tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so let's thank Giovanni again. And the next talk is from uh, Blessing Musimenta from the University of Bologna. So she will talk about the new discovery space opened by Rosita, ionized AGN outflows from IFED selected samples. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Blessing Musimenta, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Bologna. I'm working with Machera Brusa, who is among us here. And, uh, there is also a big team from the Erosita AGN team, but not limited to that. I'm also part of the Bid for Best project, which is an ITN project, and um, that consists like uh, 13 students, and six of them are here. They have their posters, so if you're interested in looking at uh, the work that we are doing in the ITN, you can look at their posters. So I'm going to talk about um, the various methods that we have used to select uh, AGN that have outflows in the Erosita. And to begin with, no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. So um, many speakers have already talked about AGN feedback, but I'll give a okay. This is better. I'll give a brief overview. So just to understand that AGN feedback uh, provides a link between the energy produced by the AGN and the surrounding environment, and for that reason, it it is a key component in the galaxy evolution models. 
And therefore, to understand this, we need to understand how the supermassive black holes grow and evolve. And there are different processes that have been suggested to trigger the formation and evolution of the supermassive black hole, which include the internal processes, the internal processes such as burn disk instabilities, or the external processes such as the mergers. And for that, you can look at Easy Garrett's talk on Tuesday for more details. So in case of the merger scenario, the supermassive black hole grows within the, within the merger, and then it is followed by the maximum accretion, which, which actually releases tremendous amount of radiation, uh, radiation pressure into the surrounding in form of winds or outflows. And these winds or outflows, they, they tend to provide a mechanism that actually removes or hits the gas within the environment, and thus quenching the star formation and stops the further growth of the uh, sorry stops the further growth of the supermassive uh, black hole as seen from here and here i was trying to show how the we can see the suppression of uh, star formation if you consider model with a supermassive black hole okay So with, uh, in, the AGN in the AGN feedback phase, which is actually a short phase as compared to the AGN lifetime, we expect the AGN during that, uh, that, in that phase to be highly obscured with quorum densities that are greater than exponent 22 per square centimeters, and also highly rum um, luminous in the infrared and faint in the optical. So we observe them with the red colors and also with high barometric luminosities. So why do we care about uh, AGN feedback? As I already said, it provides, uh, it is a key component in the galaxy evolution models and the simulations. So we need, uh, it is important to understand AGN feedback if we need to understand the galaxy evolution. And also, if we study these AGN outflow properties, we can, better provide, we can provide better constraints for the galaxy evolution theoretical models. But why this specific this study? It is because um, previous studies have actually always focused on, in, on small and incomplete pre-selected samples, and this can bring bias when we are trying to, uh, to interpret the, the AGN properties in the outflowing phase. So for this reason, that's why we are considering various methods to select this agent with minimal biases. So we are doing this within the, the IFEDS catalog, which is the, the, the catalog from EROSITA that was produced within the four days of EROSITA deep observations and um, within 142 square degrees. And um, it was chosen to be rich in both photometric and spectroscopic multi-wavelength coverage. So to begin with is the, are the color selection methods that we have applied. First, we applied the R minus W1, then the soft flux um, to optical ratio. And we have isolated sources that lie in this region which we expect to be in the feedback phase. They are highlighted by red. And also, um, also I highlight the, the blue star here, which is the XID 439. This is the first source that we, we found in the pilot study that we did on the hard sample of effects, and we found it with outflows. So I'm highlighting this source, and uh, as you can see, it also appears in the selection locus that we are considering for selecting our sources. So um, another method I applied uh, is the R minus W1 and I minus W4. And we also highlight the sources that, we, that may be having high chances of being in the feedback phase in the red here. So in addition to these methods, I've also applied uh, different methods like the I minus W1 and then the, also the, the hard flux to optical ratio and the R minus W4. And from this selection, we have isolated around 853 candidates. And we call this sample A. 
Then um, also we also applied the X-ray and optical spectral properties. And since we expect aging the feedback phase to be highly obscured, and then also with maximum accretion, meaning their ending tone ratio is greater than the effective ending tone limit. So we expect these candidates to appear in this region, and there are different uh, uh, scholars that have already used this selection method to select these kind of objects. So these are the candidates we selected, and we also highlight the XID 439. So from this selection, uh, we have isolated three, 381 candidates, and we call this our sample B. So when, I rep uh, after, when we represent our selected candidates on the column density distribution, we actually see that our candidates appear to be more obscured than the overall effects sample. This means that our selection methods are actually isolating uh, obscured sources. And we have also selected some sources for follow-up observations. I should mention that. Then um, when I also put the, the sources that we have isolated on the luminosity in the optical and luminosity in the UV, we can see that the sources that we selected using the column density and ending tone ratio, they also appear to be blue by this definition in Louis 20, 2020. And those selected by the color selections, they actually appear to be, to be red above this line. So I, we went ahead to select uh, candidates for the spectral analysis. And from this, uh, from the X-ray and optical spec, uh, spectral properties sample, we have selected 336 candidates with red shift less than one. And then from the color selected sample, we selected 16 candidates with uh, spectra, but only four of them have red shift less than one. The reason we are considering red shift less than one is because we are focusing on ionized outflows and uh, traced by the O3 line. So we are considering only sources that have red shift less than one. And then uh, we use the, the pi Q fit. And this is uh, one of our samples where you can see that we have the blue shifted broad component that is an indication of the outflow. So I should just mention that we did not do the fit for all the 40 candidates, but only 30 that had reliable fits. And on that 30, 18 are promising candidates with outflows with the full width at half maximum ranging from 1,000 to 3,000 kilometers per second. So, uh, so in addition to the candidates from the EFEDs, we have also compiled a sample from the literature for those AGN that have been confirmed with outflows, ionized outflows at redshift uh, greater than 0 0.5. And since their outflow properties have been determined using a different Assumptions, we try to homogenize the assumptions. So, um, so we use the same geometry, we assume the same geometry and the gas electron density. Then we recomputed the velocity in case the velocity given was uh, recomputed using the different methods. And we did the same for our work. And then we computed the mass outflow using this formula, which depends on the O3 line luminosity and the, the gas electron density. Then we computed the mass outflow rate using this formula. So looking at this figure, which is the mass outflow rate and the AGN barometric luminosity, we obtained a scaling relation, a correlation in the gray. And um, we also highlight the relation from Fiori 2017. And we also try to caracod using the redshift, although we don't see a significant trend in the, in the redshift. So from this, uh, using our large sample, we, we can say that this is for sure the largest sample of ionized outflows at redshift 
greater than 0 0.5 as compared to the previous comparisons. And with that, we still see a correlation between the AGN barometric luminosity and the mass outflow rate. So I, uh, we, recom we computed the kinetic coupling efficiency of our sources. And from this, you, we can see that uh, we, these, are the source, these are the kinetic coupling efficiency that we, we computed. And these are the theoretical predictions that are provided in Harrison 2018. So if we, when we compare that, we see that, in fact, 30% of our sources, they have their coupling kinetic coupling efficiency that is greater than 1%, and that means that those 30% of our outflows, they may have significant impact on their host galaxies. So that uh, being said, I should also mention uh, the project which I've been doing in the last three months, which is the Kashzi project, which I was working on with Deva Alexander and my supervisor, Machera. And from this project, I've selected um, sources that have reliable ortholine luminosity and sulfur two line with the intention to measure the electron densities and also their spatial extensions. And um, I have just put them in um, the mass of rate and AGN barometric luminosity plane. And you can see them here, but these ones are preliminary results because I've assumed the radius and the electron density because I'm still working on that. So we hope to, to increase our sample with this Kashizi sample. So with that being said, um, I should mention that we have, uh, from, the sample, from our selected sample, 60% of our sample they have outflows, but when I talk about this 60% is not for a uh, thousand sources, but for the 18 candidates because we didn't have the, the spectra for, for the other sources. So this is an indication that in fact our methods, they are efficient in selecting AGNs with outflows. And we hope maybe to find like hundreds and thousands of, of uh, outflows in the upcoming Erosita or Sky surveys. Thank you for listening. Anyway, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, there is one, one source that seems to be an incredibly outlier. If you go back to the correlations, there is one source, yeah, that's got, that, yeah, that's star that's got a really high, well, uh, adding to fraction or accretion rate, but then it's got very low elbow. Do you know anything what kind, about that source? That looks really interesting. It's completely off. It, uh, in fact, I've received many comments about this source, but uh, it looks strange, but this is... Uh, strange is good, right? Strange is good. That's what yeah, I like. it's good, but I still need maybe to find out more about this source, really. Okay. Yeah. All right. There's nothing... Anyway, yeah, okay. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. About, sorry, Giacomo Venturi here. About this source, could it be maybe a faded AGN? So you currently have a very low bolometric luminosity, but you are seeing the mass outflow rate that uh, was accelerated uh, in the past. Just an idea. I don't know if you can check this somehow. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, check, uh, I'll check with that. Yeah, thank you. We now have Anna Feltre, uh, who's going to talk about AG nebular emission from UV to infrared. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So today, um, I would like to discuss uh, 
um, how we can best use the um, atomic emission lines uh, to identify AGN. And I will actually uh, mainly touch uh, two points. One is a, 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 an overview on uh, different uh, uh, line ratio diagnostic diagrams that we can use for AGN classification uh, over different wavelength ranges. So from the UV to optical to mid infrared. And um, if I still have time, I will uh, show an exercise we are performing in which we are trying uh, to assess how best we can actually infer the AGM fraction starting from line ratios. Uh, so let me start uh, with this famous diagram that uh, all of you are familiar with, I suppose. So it has been uh, commonly used uh, uh, to uh, identify and classify AGN on large surveys as well uh, used uh, and applied to IFU data. Uh, so it's very well calibrated in the local universe and you can see that you can, uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, distinguish AGN and uh, H region using uh, strong optical line ratios. Uh, but uh, one main question is here, how can we exploit this diagram when we move to our higher redshift, so a redshift higher than one or two? First, as uh, the, um, uh, um, with evolution of cosmic time, uh, uh, the properties, the physical properties of the SAM evolve, in particular there is, for example, a decrease in metallicities which actually uh, move uh, uh, the AGN from uh, uh, the right side of the BPT towards uh, the region occupied by uh, 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 um, H2 region driven ionizations. Uh, so uh, this actually, the classification between AGN and star forming galaxies uh, 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 are uh, being modeled. So there is a modeling of the classification. And also, uh, uh, um, um, deep spectroscopic data at redshift above one or two are still not available. So until JWST is not gonna provide us with this information, we are actually mainly uh, probing the, uh, with the current spectrographer, we're actually mainly probing the UV emission uh, of the rest frame UV emission of, uh, of the galaxies. So in the recent year, there has been a lot of attention on this UV line ratio, which are actually uh, uh, seems to be a quite good tracer of high, of hard ionizing uh, sources such as AGN and shocks. So you can see an example of a UV diagnostic diagrams here, in which we have um, AGN selected uh, on the strength of the carbon-4 line, and this uh, orange and purple uh, area are actually uh, prediction from photoionization models. Uh, so this diagram actually uh, recently via, being applied to uh, many uh, targets in the literature up to uh, Redshift uh, uh, 7. Uh, so they, they are very promising. Uh, there is one thing uh, we, we need to uh, uh, take into account is that this uh, UV-based diagnostics are not as well calibrated as optical diagnostics. Uh, so, uh, as well as both optical and UV lines are strongly affected by dust attenuation. Uh, so we may want to explore other wavelength regimes that are actually probing the uh, um, most obscure regions of, uh, of the galaxies. And indeed, the mid-infrared is actually providing uh, a plethora of low to high ionization atomic lines uh, that are um, um, uh, instrumental to identify hard ionizing sources such as uh, 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 the AGN luminosity. So you can see here an example of diagnostic diagrams uh, from uh, Group Pioneer 2016. So these are actually uh, 66, uh, 76 uh, targets from the 12 micron galaxy sample. Uh, they have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, homogeneous Spitzer infrared spectroscopy plus uh, a plethora of uh, multi wavelength uh, data available. Uh, one main thing related to the mid infrared diagnostics is that they have, they have not been extensively used as, uh, as uh, others, perhaps, and uh, as well as uh, they have never been compared uh, with optical, so nobody has tried to put together the information coming from multiple uh, wavelength range, spectroscopic information coming from multiple wavelength range on the same source. So uh, to this purpose, 
we actually performed um, optical spectroscopy of 43 of the targets that I was showing before to, in order to have homogeneous IRS and optical coverage. And uh, our main aim was actually to combine uh, infrared and optical information uh, on the same source and test the diagnostics and, and the models as well. So our, is uh, the same uh, photoionization model able to reproduce uh, uh, both the optical and dimming infrared ratio? Uh, this is actually um, is a very important question to answer because uh, MIRI is going to provide us uh, specially resolved data for low redshift galaxies that we can combine with the specially resolved data already existing in the optical, for example. And in the future, there will be uh, uh, mid and far infrared uh, spectroscopic observation that will probe higher uh, uh, targets at higher redshift, so we can do some preparatory work for these future uh, surveys and mission. So. Uh, here we have an optical and a mid infrared uh, diagnostic diagrams. Uh, you see our sources here are color coded as function of the uh, fraction of the AGN to the mid infrared uh, continuum between 5 and 40 micron. And the green shaded area here are uh, the photoionization, uh, is a grid of photoionization models. So why we are able to re uh, basically reproduce all the optical data? We are able to reproduce only a part uh, of uh, the um, um, data in the mid infrared diagnostic with using pure AGN photoionization, uh, which are actually those with a higher uh, AGN contribution to the mid infrared. Uh, so we, we worked uh, in this direction and try and uh, we explore different possibilities. So uh, the most obvious is of course uh, uh, a contribution from uh, a star formation which may be obscure in the optical. Uh, uh, that's going to drive uh, the line ratio uh, toward, towards, uh, it's going to reduce, the contribution of star formation is going to reduce uh, the line ratios. And, and indeed, uh, if you see here, uh, there are few uh, upper limits from uh, the fernandez Ontiveros 2016 star forming galaxies. And, and you can see that there is a nice trend with uh, like decreasing, uh, with uh, adding a star formation component uh, starting, for example, from this. I actually took as reference uh, um, a model here. Uh, but this is actually not the only uh, uh, um, source that can actually, or reason, physical uh, reason that can drive, uh, can populate uh, this uh, lower uh, left area of the uh, diagnostic diagrams. But, oops. Um, another possibility is the harder ionizing radiation. So I've, used, I've been using uh, different uh, uh, spectral slope of the uh, mm, l uh, luminosity from the accretion disk, which is the one driving the ionization, basically. So uh, we can see that we can partially explain at least uh, um, part of, um, uh, of, of, of our targets, as well as uh, if we want to uh, uh, another source of uh, uh, hard ionizing radiation are actually fast radiative shocks, which also move uh, the predicted line ratio on the lower left part of uh, uh, the, the diagram. So we are actually facing um, the problem here that we need to be able to disentangle this uh, uh, mm, mechanism. So uh, if we have a specially resolved data, we, we have seen that we may be able to study the spatial extent and so being able to uh, discriminate between different ionizing sources. But then if we don't have uh, this kind of data available, we need to first perhaps combine multiple, uh, uh, the information from multiple emission lines on different wavelength range as uh, combined with advanced statistical techniques. Uh, so we actually just started uh, our work uh, in this sense. So we, um, we are implementing uh, a GM photoionization model inside uh, a Bayesian statistics tool, which already contains the continuum from, uh, from the stars as well as the nebular emission from the H2 region. And what we did was to um, create some mock spectra of redshift 0 and redshift 2, um, pure uh, star forming galaxy, pure AGN, and uh, composite, uh, uh, composite objects ranging from the orange uh, to the violet. Uh, uh, the dots are actually uh, redshift 0, and, and the stars are uh, redshift 2 uh, uh, mock uh, uh, spectra, basically. So you can see how they populated the optical uh, diagnostic uh, um, diagram. 
And um, we, 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 we computed these uh, spectra, we added noise, and we went to, with the same tool, we actually fit different line ratio, optical line ratio. We are limiting our study for the moment to optical. Um, with the main aim of study, how well we can retrieve different uh, physical parameters of the interstellar medium, as well as uh, how we can retrieve actually the IGM fraction of these sources. Yes. Um, so you can see here the result from, uh, for the redshift zero and the redshift two uh, um, spectra. These are the mean uh, result. So this is the measure of uh, fraction of the uh, contribution of the narrow line region uh, photoionization to the H beta line as function of the signal to noise on H beta. And uh, uh, to actually classify a source as a, uh, AGN, you, uh, for the redshift zero, you just need um, is a signal to noise on H beta higher than three is sufficient, but it's not sufficient to actually uh, get the correct fraction of uh, the uh, contribution from the narrow line region. For this, you will need to go to uh, a signal to noise on H beta higher than 10 to get it correct. For redshift 2, instead you need uh, a signal to noise higher than 10 uh, to uh, uh, identify the presence of an AGN and higher than 20 to actually uh, come close to have a, um, um, a value, uh, a, a more accurate, accurate value of the fra uh, fractional contribution of the AGN to the line ratio. So I'm going to uh, leave you with uh, some concluding remark. So we have seen that UV and mid infrared line ratio diagnostics are actually good complementary diagnostic to optical allowance. And if we really want uh, um, uh, accurate uh, um, um, estimates of the physical properties of the ionizing sources, we, have my, uh, we, um, we most likely need to uh, uh, co um, combine together all this information. Uh, so uh, the more observable the mirror in this sense. So we don't have to limit ourselves only to line ratio, but we want to consider uh, multiple wavelength regime, line profiles, and, and ancillary data as well. Uh, uh, we, we want to take advantage of uh, uh, analytical tools to study the possible bias of uh, AGN classification and also on the study of the physical properties of the ionized gas. And this is actually very relevant for the design of future observation because the, this is actually, uh, these studies are actually driving the choice of observable uh, required uh, for our specific studies and also uh, can uh, help us in uh, computing models more tailored to specific survey and include them in mock catalogs. So I leave you here, I thank you, introducing you uh, my little helper here, who is actually <laughs> currently supervising my works. <laughs> Ciao Anna, thank you, very nice talk. I have a question. It, it is, of course, very important to combine as many lines as possible, but how can you take into account the fact that uh, the contribution from some clouds are completely hidden in the optical with respect to the far infrared? Yeah, this is a, a, a very complex task indeed. I don't think I have a solution to your question. So, um, one problem is actually that uh, you are also combining uh, uh, information from different instruments, so, so you are not probing, uh, perhaps not probably in the same area. So you, I think um, with the specially resolved data, you may be able to do it. In theory, the model should be able um, to, to um, account for the, for the dust, for the dusty region where, where, where the optical lines don't, don't come out. So this should be self-consistent. There should be a self-consistent modeling uh, behind this, plus uh, um, being able to accurately combine the, the, observer, uh, the observation, basically. So you mean that from cloudy you don't get the intrinsic line ratios, but you get the emergent lines uh, that... You, you, have, you, can have, you can have both. I think one should move, uh, well, uh, cloudy is just one dimensional uh, modeling. Perhaps you, you one could move to 3D modeling using uh, uh, cloudy as well. There is like a pretty cloudy available, but uh, at the moment it doesn't account for the scattering in between the different cells. So um, it's all anyway an approximation as well.
Thank you very much. Very nice talk. And I, I especially like the last part with the modeling of spectra with, for the future, basically, which is, would be important for the future design of uh, spectroscopic surveys. So you tested the signal to noise ratio. Did you maybe test the spectral resolution? As one of the parameters, how it well we detection. we we in this exercise we pra parameterized to the uh, signal to noise on H beta because that's w where we we were using the fractional contribution. Uh, we were calibrating the, the fractional contribution of AGN and star formation, but I don't think we have checked the the, the full I, I guess resolution. many many uh, surveys, spectroscopic surveys, would really like to know that. That yeah. would be a kind of yeah. This is something that can be implemented in the mock catalogs. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is Luca Fofano, who's talking about the magic view of extreme blazers. Good afternoon. So today we'll talk about this, uh, the magic view of extreme blazers on behalf of many people and also of the magic collaboration. Let me introduce the topic, so here you know very well what blazers are. So basically these are jetted AGNs with the jet pointing very close to the line of sight of the observer. Uh, the spectral energy distribution is usually uh, composed of two main humps. The first on the left is called the synchrotron hump, on the right you find the high energy or gamma ray hump. And uh, in extreme blazers we have a, a push, a, these two humps are pushed to, highest, to the highest energies and uh, the first one enters deeply the X-ray band, and the second one enters deeply the gamma ray, gamma ray band. And uh, the, ar the archetypal extreme blazer is called 1ES0229. Why they are important? Because uh, most of them are very, very uh, energetic, and uh, they are probably the most energetic blazer ever, ever found. The emission mechanism and also the particle acceleration uh, is uh, still not very understood, and uh, they extend the blazer family to higher energies. And this is something that uh, opens new questions in uh, trying to understand the full framework of, this, of these objects. And they are also very interesting for several science cases, thanks especially to the gamma ray spectrum. As you see here, this is the archetypal, a typical uh, spectral energy distribution of these uh, uh, blazers. And as you see, the synchrotron hump is peaking at, at more than uh, several keV. And then the hard uh, spectrum is peaking above several TeV. Uh, the gamma ray spectrum is particularly important. This is why uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm focusing on this. So let me introduce the very high energy gamma ray band. Most of the uh, instruments that are investigating this energy band are uh, called Cherenkov telescope. They, may, they use this uh, Cherenkov technique. And in the last, uh, let's say, 25 years, we discovered more than 250 sources. So the, we really opened a new window in this, uh, uh, in this energy band. I just came back from the MAGIC site. The MAGIC is a, a system of two telescopes. And uh, these are uh, placed uh, on, the, on a mountain in the highland of La Palma in the Carnegie Highlands. And is one of the, of the three tele main telescopes the current, that we call the current generation of Cherenkov telescopes. Uh, concerning extreme blazers detected in this band, uh, among these 250 sources, we know at least more or less 30 sources. Uh, we, you may think that there are not many sources, but actually they are because it's uh, very difficult to uh, identify them and also to find new sources in this energy band. So these 30 sources have been discovered with, the, with a lot of uh, uh, telescopes, of a lot of instruments, especially the, the first three that are S, Magic and Veritas, the, the current generation of telecom telescopes. I think that Magic did a very good job in the last 10-15 uh, years uh, discovering this uh, uh, and, and investigating this, uh, this field, but uh, discovering uh, at least 10 sources of this, uh, of this type. And uh, uh, so about one third of the sources were discovered by MAGIC. Uh, it's always difficult to uh, define, identify the, the sources. So some of these sources are still under discussion if they are or not extreme blazers. And now I will show you uh, why it's so difficult. 
So basically, this is one of the most important uh, things that are uh, being uh, understood basically in the last, uh, in the last years, uh, that uh, we may have subpopulation of uh, extreme blazers. And uh, on the right, you see the superposition of two uh, uh, spectral energy distribution of two sources that I will now mention. And uh, uh, as you see, especially in the uh, gamma ray part, that uh, there are crucial differences on the, uh, in the spectral behavior. And so I will talk uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the next minutes about three main categories, RTV extreme blazer, so uh, similarly basically to the archetypal extreme blazer, soft TV, and uh, a very new category that I, will, I mean, it has been called several, in several ways, intermittent, temporary, or flaring extreme blazer. Let me introduce the first, the first category are TVH extreme blazers. So these are um, basically the f very similar to the archetypal, and they are at the, at the beginning they were thought to be the only uh, types of uh, sources of, uh, of this kind. Uh, as you see, uh, there are just a bunch of sources that are confirmed to be hard TV extreme blazers, and uh, uh, in this, Hess and Veritas did a great job uh, some years ago discovering some of these sources, and uh, as you see here, there's no normalization between the uh, three sources that I show here, and uh, they are very, very similar in the gamma ray spectrum. As you see, in the, uh, they, they barely reach the sensitivity of our Cherenkov telescopes uh, in, uh, uh, in, gamma, in very high energy gamma rays, but then when we deabsorb the spectrum by the EBL interaction, they are very, very hard and they peak above several TV. Uh, then, uh, let me mention another discovery that was made directly by MAGIC, is this PGC242248. This is a soft TV extreme blazer, uh, or you see it in the gamma ray spectrum. Uh, I proposed it to MAGIC and it was observed and then uh, discovered in 2018, and uh, I think that is a very interesting source because um, several properties are really uh, intermediate, let's say, between hard TV sources and the next category, that is uh, the third group that I mentioned before, so intermittent or temporary or flaring extreme blazer. In this case, I will start from a very uh, historical plot about this source, Markarian 501. is a very bright, very nearby, very well-known blazer, and uh, it's very well uh, sampled um, on the multi wavelength point of view. So we know we have several campaigns that, that uh, uh, characterize this source. And uh, one of the most interesting fe features is that uh, when it's in low state, it's not an extreme blazer. When it's in high state, because this source, as you see, flared several times, flares uh, frequently, it becomes uh, an extreme blazer. So there is this change of category uh, that is uh, uh, represented by this source, but I will now contradict myself because in, uh, in a recent paper by, by Magic, also thanks by Magic, but uh, with a multi wavelength coverage, in 2012, uh, both during the low state and the high state, it was uh, uh, showing hard spectra and it was an extreme blazer. So it's very uh, difficult to understand because uh, different behaviors were uh, performed by the, the source, let's say, in different moments. Another, sur another very interesting feature of this that was discovered by, by MAGIC is uh, uh, pile up at 3 TV, more or less, and uh, probably is done this is thanks to the very well known, uh, very well um, uh, sampled uh, spectral uh, behavior, of this, uh, spectral uh, definition of this source, and uh, uh, it's a, probably a feature that may be present also in other, in other blazers uh, if they are uh, sampled well like this. Let me now, now mention also 1ES 1959, it's a very well known blazer, very nearby. Uh, it's another source that uh, is not an extreme blazer when in low state, but it is when it's, in, it's flaring. And it's, one, uh, it's a blazer that uh, uh, flare to very, very high uh, fluxes in, the, in, several, uh, in several episodes, in several events, flaring events. And also in this case, you see that uh, the, it becomes an extreme blazer clearly in, uh, uh, when, when flaring. And also 1ES2344 is another source that uh, when in low state is not an extreme blazer and when in high state it's an extreme blazer. It's very interesting because also in this case we have very, very um, strong shifts of the synchrotron peak during the flaring activities. 
all these sources, I've shown three sources, are not hard, but are, they are soft when flaring. So it's not clear if this category is connected with the soft TV sources that I was mentioning before or not. So as you see, basically, as you see, the, um, the search for extreme new extreme blazers is revealing uh, new sources, but also new behaviors uh, that are very difficult to, under to understand and to, to, to put in a common framework of these, uh, uh, of the, of these sources. So for this reason, magic is uh, playing an important role in finding new sources. It's very difficult, and you can see it in this uh, first catalog that we, we did. Uh, among nine sources, we, did, uh, we, we, we reached the detection of uh, four new sources, and uh, we, we took new data with new states of the source of, for, two, for two of them, and several uh, non detection of with upper limits. But now we are continuing this search. We have uh, an amount of time that is dedicated every year to, to the search for new extreme blazers, and this is another source that was uh, recently discovered. They proposed it in uh, 2019, and it was discovered in 2020. One RXSJ0081 is another soft TV uh, source, and uh, it will be published among other sources uh, in the next, uh, in the second magic catalog that will be that is uh, now in uh, in preparation. So let, let, me, let, me intro, let me conclude uh, my, my presentation. So the, I think that uh, I've convinced you that uh, the, 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 in, uh, the, 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 the extreme blazers at the moment are really a very emerging topic, uh, especially because as we find the new sources, we, as we find the new sources, we, we are adding new pieces to this framework, to this, uh, to this topic, and we are understanding that actually they are very different. So I think that the search for new extreme blazers is very important, and uh, it's not uh, something that is something that we can do now. Uh, we can do it, it and we are uh, it's true that the CTA will be the next generation for the Cherenkov telescope, but probably the, this science data will will be available in five, ten years from now. But today we can do something with the current generation of uh, Cherenkov telescope we can, that can act as pathfinders for, for, for this search, uh, building the way to understand how to select and uh, detect them uh, in, uh, with the best condition, with the best strategies uh, in gamma rays. Thank you. I was wondering, given the, the duty cycle that you've seen for, for the source, that one that changed uh, aspect, uh, how likely it is that also the other could do the same and you're not detecting it at this moment? Thank you for the question. It's, a, it's very interesting, uh, it's, uh, but it's very difficult to answer uh, because the flares, during, usually the duration is very, very short, a few days, and we have to be, let's say, very lucky to coordinate with other instruments on the multivalent point of view to catch them and to point our telescope in gamma rays and to, to, to be able to, to measure this, uh, this new flux, let's say, for this uh, short duration. But uh, it, it's possible. The problem is now related to the luminosity of these sources. So we, we don't know if, for example, hard TV sources or other sources are actually detected only because we are integrating over a high state of the, of the source, but they are too far away for us to detect the low state. So this is something that we don't know. It's very difficult to put together different data sets for, because the instruments need different integration time and so on. So it's, uh, this is an open question. Thank you. Now we have Gabriele Bruni, who's talking about characterizing the gamma ray sky with new generation radio surveys. The emerging population of radio galaxies. Okay. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, today I will show you some results of the project we are carrying out at EAPS, and in particular the one about radio galaxies uh, selected at high energy. We've been working on this project in the past five years, so we have accumulated now a, a nice view on these objects. Uh, when you start uh, working at high energy, uh, as most of you know, uh, putting together Integral and Swift, uh, you can get the most extensive list of AGN selected in the soft gamma ray band. And these two instruments in particular have collected data for the past 20 years. So now they have a very good census of these kind of objects. Plus, uh, in the JEV range, Fermi joined them later. So uh, I will show you at the end of the presentation how you, how you can get peculiar objects uh, when combining the selection of, of uh, JEV and MEV energies. So why radio galaxies? Well, they are, of course, a small fraction of the uh, AGN samples at high energy. So for example, you have only 8% in the integral sample and only 1% uh, oops, in the, uh, here it is, in the Fermilat sample. So uh, they are uh, only a few, but uh, despite the rarity, they offer you a unique view on the accretion ejection phenomenon because you can study accretion and jets in the same objects and their connection, and in particular, as the final graal, we should uh, have a duty cycle for the jets. That is what is most interesting in these objects. So the life cycle of radio galaxy begins with very compact uh, sources like GPS, CSS that uh, we have mentioned in the past days, and then evolve into the classical FR1 and FR2 with an extended morphology, lobes, jets, and everything on. Then eventually some of them, a uh, small fraction, can evolve into giant radio galaxies that can reach almost one megaparsec. So uh, they are very extended objects, the, the largest uh, single entities in the universe, we could say. Uh, but it's not clear yet what makes them grow so much. So uh, there is much to learn about this, this, this phase. And finally, um, eventually they die, uh, leaving a, a glowing emission, radio emission from the lobes with the expanded plasma that uh, keeps emitting in the radio band at lower and lower uh, frequencies, while the central core is not visible anymore in the radio band. So in particular, giant radio galaxies, as I was saying, um, they are, um, th there is a threshold that is set at uh, 0.7 megaparsec, but most of them can reach uh, a, a linear scale that is larger than one megaparsec. They uh, are difficult to study because they have a low surface brightness, so you need a very sensitive observations. You need a, a good, um, a long observation in radio to have a good coverage. Uh, of the UV plane able to reconstruct, to recover all these extended emissions from the lobes. And uh, for this reason, um, also for this reason, in classical radio surveys, only a small fraction is giant radio galaxy. It is between 1 and 6%. Nowadays, thanks to the new generation radio surveys, especially from, uh, from LOFAR, like uh, LOTS DR2, we have reached a census of hundreds of objects that allow us for the first time to study statistically this class of object. So, and indeed, uh, what we hope to learn about them is how they reach such a huge size, whether it's uh, just uh, a long activity time, a favorable environment, or maybe uh, a higher jet power that can uh, launch a jet for a, a million of years. So we, um, we started, as I said before, from the soft gamma ray catalogs, and uh, to study the radio counterparts of this AGN, we uh, cross-correlated with uh, the classical radio service. It is NVSS, first sounds that are now 20 years old, but still offer a, a, a view on the, on the entire sky, so you can match them with satellite catalogs. And uh, visually inspecting uh, almost 1,000 images and searching for extended structure, uh, we measured the largest angular sites and end up with uh, 67 radio galaxies with a double morphology, uh, 31 have a size larger than half a megaparsec, and 15 are uh, giant radio galaxies because they, they uh, 
they are past the threshold of uh, 0.7 megaparsec. This fraction is 22%, that is already uh, peculiar because it's four times what you find when you start from the radio selection. So there must be something there that favors the giant size of these objects. So starting with these premises, uh, we decided to, to uh, try to understand wh what make this GRG more abundant in the uh, soft gamma ray band with respect to radio catalogs. So uh, the first step, of course, is uh, looking into the literature because m most of them, at least, are, uh, have been studied in, in the past from uh, other authors or from other surveys. So we found that uh, 6 over 15 present signs of uh, restarting activity, radioactivity that I will show you later. And this is already 40%. Then, uh, starting from this step, we decided to take more radio observations, uh, in particular with a single dish, Effersberg radio telescope, to probe the SCD of the core and look for uh, the GPS cores that are young radio galaxies. And uh, also at lower energies, we collected some GMRT observation. Unfortunately, in the, uh, in the same time, uh, new radio surveys were, uh, were uh, delivered. So we could count on TGSS observation and lost the R2 observation in the megahertz range to study the extended morphology of the lobes. So when you look for signs of restarted radioactivity, you can have different indicators of this, okay? So you can have a double-double morphology uh, that is, sorry, that is, um, we have already discussed it in the past day, you can have two couple of lobes, and uh, the most internal couple is the new one, while the most extended one is the previous phase. So in this case, you could, uh, you can have a, a two radio phases, okay? Then uh, uh, X shapes are a bit more debated because uh, you can have an X shape if you have a new radio phase that is on a, on a different jet axis with respect to the previous one, but you can also get this morphology uh, with uh, backflowing gas from the lobes that is later, later um, bounced on the, on the halo, the central galaxy. So in some cases, it's just an hydrodynamical effect of the plasma going uh, back and forth in the, in the medium. Um, other, another interesting case is the radio cocoon, uh, that is um, an extended plasma that is, uh, uh, in, in, I mean, it's all around the central lobes and uh, it's a marker of a previous activity that is so old that it only leaves this um, uh, very diffuse trace. And finally, uh, the GPS I was mentioning before, that is if you look into the core and you build the SCD in the radio, in the radio uh, range, in particular in the gigahertz domain, you can get a, a, a peak uh, spectrum that indicates a young uh, radio source and in this context indicate a second radio phase with respect to the one that produced the, the more extended uh, uh, lobes. So we, we scan all the sources with uh, our data or archival data or survey data and uh, what we found is that uh, more than half of that present a GPS in their core, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture. And um, uh, these are two examples. So you can see uh, here th there is a compact core with a GPS SED in the radio. And here you can see the same zooming in into the core. Plus, we uh, found uh, morphologies that are reminders of uh, uh, a new radio phase. So, in total, we had uh, 13 over 15 of our object with uh, signs of our restarted radioactivity. This is, uh, of course, a huge fraction. And this, together with the high fraction of giant radio galaxies, suggests that something is going on there. Uh, fortunately, oops, no, it's not working. Why? Only one. No, it <laughs> doesn't accept only one input. Okay. 
So uh, thanks to the last year to survey that was released uh, in the middle of our study, let's say so, we could uh, explore more uh, morphologies and we found the peculiar sources like this one in which uh, you have an inner jet axis that seems to stay on a different angle with respect to the one connecting the hot spot here with the core, plus you have a diffuse emission here, uh, a reminder of, of a um, a FET radio galaxy, what they call a FET radio galaxy, FET morphology, and uh, with a bit of imagination, maybe the jet is going counter jet, counterclockwise and is producing this uh, old emission, then this more recent one, and the young one here. But of course, we need to explore more. Another interesting case is this X shaped, in which you have, um, thanks to LOFAR, we discovered uh, really globes that are here, barely visible, H1, H2. Uh, since they are more extended than the actual lobe, uh, this seems to be a genuine X shaped and not just an hydrodynamical effect. Okay, I'm concluding. So, just uh, a few more slides to show you um, what we can do with the new generation radio surveys like uh, VILAS and uh, uh, RAX. Uh, we cross-correlated uh, this uh, new service with uh, uh, the radio galaxy from our sample that were only also detected with uh, Fermi. And uh, we found a resolved morphology thanks to the uh, improved uh, sensitivity and resolution of this survey. And in particular, in our latest work, we could get the SED uh, and uh, um, discover that uh, the gamma ray emission in the jet band is uh, almost 10 times lower than what you expect from the core. So we modeled this with uh, recent models from uh, Persich et al. And uh, the, the fitting uh, indicates a possible contribution from the lobes through inverse Compton on the ambient photon fields. So the lobes of this radio galaxy can have a, uh, an interesting contribution in the JEV domain that is something new uh, that, you, that you can explore only with these new uh, radio surveys that uh, are covering the sky and are uh, uh, thanks to which uh, a lot of radio galaxies in the JEV domain will emerge and will give us a, a new view on this uh, subpopulation. Of course, SKA will do even better than this. We will have uh, more resolution, more sensitivities, and uh, possibly more uh, radio galaxy will populate the high energy sky, giving more insights on the faint population that is there but uh, has not been explored yet. So I leave you with the, a bit of publicity of our COSPAR session in July about 20 years of AGN discovers with uh, space observation, and thank you very much. I, I always wonder if when you see this, uh, um, you know, uh, black hole in which you think that the axis is spinning, mm -hmm. it could instead be, I instead of the backflow that you were claiming, mm -hmm. it could be interaction with the ISM. Do you have evidence of that, that that can change the morphology? In the low power ones, you see that. I don't know if these are okay. so powerful that it wouldn't uh, be possible to, to bend the jet in this way. Well, in, s in some cases, yes, in the sense that if you have only an external X shaped, you can imagine that is the interaction with the ISM. In some other cases, you have a, a jet that starts from the core that is in a different axis. So it's hard to imagine that uh, the density is so different in such a small scale to give you a very different uh, angle. But yes, there are many factors that can contribute to this. Uh, one of which is a possible binary black hole that is uh, uh, causing a precession. No? That is the most interesting case, but is also really rare. Yeah. Uh, we collected Chandra radio data uh, recently. Uh, we need to analyze that. Uh, maybe something pop up in the in the nucleus that is new. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, thank you. Now we have Giovanni Mazzolari, who's going to talk about hidden supermassive black hole in the deep universe. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giovanni Mazzolari. I'm a first year PhD student in Bologna. And today I'm going to present the first steps and the first result uh, about my current PhD project that is focused on the identification of hidden AGN in the deep uh, universe. So, uh, sorry, yes. Both theory and observation agree in suggesting that high redshift galaxies are on average smaller and richer in gas and dust with respect to the local one. And uh, so since observation uh, is thought to be related to both dust close to the central supermassive black hole, but also to the cold interstellar medium of the host galaxy, we expect that obscuration is announced at high redshift. In particular, Vito shows that in, in, this, in his paper, the fraction of obscure AGN grows from 10, 20% in the local universe up to 80, 90% at redshift four. And also, um, analytical studies on the properties of the interstellar medium around AGN suggest the same conclusion. Numerical simulation further predict that 99% of AGN and redshift higher than seven might be obscured. So currently we are probably missing the bulk, the bulk of the AGN population. And so identifying and then studying the properties of obscured AGN at high redshift would be crucial for many purposes, in particular constraining the population of AGN at different redshift, understand the cosmological build-up of supermassive black hole, and also constrain the relation between supermassive black hole and their environment. So in order to do that, a promising, very promising field to look for obscure AGN at high redshift is the J1030 field. I'm a J1030 guy, and uh, uh, as Marco Mignoli presented uh, this morning, J1030 field has been imaged in both optical and near infrared, it's covered by an IREC mosaic, is it has been observed also by Aztec in the millimeter domain. And most importantly, thanks to the 500 kilosecond Chandra image, it is the fifth deepest X-ray X field to date. And moreover, recently, a new deep JVLA 1.4 gigahertz observation has been performed, reaching, covering all the field and reaching a sensitivity, an RMS of 2.5 microjansky. And so, enabling us to a very sensitive search for obscure AGN and in general, faint radio sources. Indeed, using radio emission is a very promising technique to select obscure AGN, since as, as X-ray, the radio emission is largely unaffected by obscuration, and it can be used, of course, as a proxy for the nuclear activity. Moreover, but while X-ray uh, surveys suffer from their limited area sensitivity combinations, X-ray surveys reaching the Mikrojansky depth can, can detect a typical non-jetted radio-quiet EGN of also moderate bolometric luminosity up to redshift six. So we have the possibility to test this selection technique that can have far-reaching implication also for the future wide and deep radio surveys that, like those that will be carried out by SKA. Moreover, this is true and all, in particular for the J1030 field and for the quality of the data we have for the J1030 field. Indeed, considering the sensitivities of the two X-ray and radio images that needed also very different times to be taken, and taking also the ratio between the radio and the X-ray flux of an average uh, radio quiet AGN, we can see that obscure sources will be primarily select in the, um, in by the, their radio emission, while, for, for example, the opposite is true for unobscured AGN. And this is true both for the local universe but also for high redshift universe. So we started from our radio sample that were built up by 1,500 radio sources in the J1030 field. We uh, um, investigated the optical and near infrared counterparts of these sources and then we focused the, on the identification of good high redshift candidates 
At third, with the first step, uh, looking at color color plots. In particular, here are presented on the left the color color plot showing the two colors R minus I versus I minus Z. Each point is a radio source with the counterpart in the I band, and in green are highlighted those sources falling into the region for R band dropout, and so expected candidate at redshift around 4.5. In particular, we included also this dense and red region here that is usually populated by uh, cold stars since uh, uh, these contaminants are excluded uh, thanks to our radio selection. Here, instead, we, um, we plot all, the, all those radio sources that has a counterpart in the Z band and we highlighted in green those sources falling into the region uh, we selected for high band dropout, and so expected candidates around redshift 5.5. So we obtain a sample of around 1,000, 100 sources, and then in order to exclude other low redshift uh, contaminants, we use SED fitting, use a hyper Z, in order to obtain photometric redshift, and we finally select a sample of 15 candidates, those selected with red circle, circles at a ratio between four and, and six. In particular, we, are, we uh, remarked here the position of uh, ID 774, that is our prototypical, prototypical candidate, since it shows a clear radio detection with an associated flux of 23 microjansky. From the SED fitting, we obtain a very robust photometric redshift uh, around uh, 4.6, that corresponds, that at this redshift, the radio, the radio flux corresponds to a radio luminosity of 4 times 10 to the 40 arc per second. And if this radio luminosity comes from the nucleo of this uh, source, and so if, if, if this radio luminosity is due to the nuclear activity, this would correspond, assuming uh, the SID of a radio quiet AGN, to a very high bolometric luminosity. So there are many indicators that suggest that this source is an AGN and not a star-forming galaxy that can be the most important contaminants of, this, our, of our sample. For example, computing the star formation rate from the uh, radio luminosity, we obtain a value that is extremely, is quite high for star-forming galaxies at redshift around five. And moreover, this candidate shows an, an, a detection in the hard band image of the X-ray image of the J1030 field. Uh, a detection that is uh, uh, below the threshold of the X-ray catalog, but that is based on seven net photons over the background noise at 99% of significance. And that corresponds to a, an X-ray luminosity around five times 10 to the 43 arc per second. So taking the relation between uh, X-ray luminosity and star formation rate, it would, be, it, it would point to an unrealistic star formation rate of 10 to the 4 solar mass per year if due only to star formation, strongly suggesting the presence of an AGN. In that case, we have also many indications that this source is heavily obscured. Indeed, the high value of the bolometric luminosity implies that its nucleus must be uh, obscure in the rest UV. Moreover, the hard band X-ray only detection implies that soft X-ray soft, soft photons um, have has been absorbed. And in particular, we estimated a three sigma lower limit of the hardness ratio, obtaining a value that suggests a ratio of 4.6, a Compton thick hydrogen column density. Moreover, taking the relation between the X-ray luminosity and the mid infrared luminosity, our source is placed below the linear li the, the relation that uh, characterized unobscured AGNs. And this place is located in, in a region where other quantum thick AGNs are located, namely the purple asterisks. So if nature and redshift will be confirmed, this might be the second. Compton TKGN ever discovered at Reshi 5 after the one studied by G. Lee in, in, uh, in these two papers uh, and in the Chandra Deep Field Sud. This source shares many features with our candidate 
And so besides its immediate scientific value, it will point that radio selection is a very promising technique to identify obscure AGN at high redshift. So as I said, ID774 is our prototypical candidate, but it, is, it was selected using the procedure we presented in the same way as the other 14 candidates. So if the nature and the redshift of all these 15 candidates will be confirmed, we will have for the first time a statistical sample of obscured AGN at redshift around five. And it will be very important for all the reason I presented at the beginning. But all this, is, of course, is exciting, both for the radio selection and both for the properties that we can, we can constrain in future, but we have to confirm redshift and nature. And so, for this reason, I proposed the SPI for different observation to as many facilities. In particular, we asked for MOTS and the X shooter spectroscopy scan in order to obtain uh, the redshift of the sources and maybe also to obtain indication of some uh, typical lines of AGN lines. Then I ask also for Noema and Alma observation of some and all the sources of our, of our sample respectively in order to do continuum snapshot in the millimeter domain of all the sources and to constrain the AGN nature thanks to the uh, ratio Q below the total infrared luminosity and the radio luminosity. Indeed, as it is possible to see from this plot on the right that is adapted from a work of Del Vecchio, if all the radio sources, oh, if all these sources of all these candidates will not be detected by the ALMA uh, snapshots, and thanks to the extremely um, deep sensitivity that we asked for the ALMA observation, this would mean that we, we will be able to constrain the agent in nature with the four sigma of significance. So the NOEMA observation were accepted few, <laughs> okay, <laughs> few weeks ago, and we are now waiting for the others. And I leave here only the future steps, future perspective of my work. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I had a curiosity of the, the source in which you estimated then to the four uh, solar mass star formation rate. In that, can you can you compute the excess luminosity of the of the AGN? Did I miss it? Just from the optical counterpart to scaling relation. Although we, you know, at these sources, we don't know if they apply. But would that, that be consistent? Okay, yes. This computation would, was made using the relation between star formation rate and the X-ray luminosity when star formation rate when the X-ray luminosity is related and due to the star formation only. So we made this computation in order to uh, see that in that case the X-ray luminosity is too high to be justified by star formation. So the, the correct value of the star formation is the one estimated from the radio luminosity or from the SAD fitting that suggested a value of the star formation rate that is really, really similar to 1,200 solar masses per year. Uh, okay. Uh, do you have maybe also the values of star formation rate and masses, uh, all, all these uh, obscure sources, uh, or you just show for the one that you... Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have them computed, com computed in the same way, so starting from the radio luminosity or from the SED fitting. This is one of the well-constrained star formation rate from the SED fitting but also the other sources shows high value of the star formation rate higher than five, five, 600 solar masses per year. And so they are quite all uh, star-forming sources. Maybe- They are all star-buster. 
I mean, uh, with respect. Starburst, if they are star forming galaxies, or there is an excess in the radio luminosity due to the nuclear activity. This is the the what what we want to 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 look for. Mm -hmm. If the radio luminosity excess is due to the nuclear activity of the are Starburst galaxies, yes. Thank you. And now we are moving to the poster session, right? Yes, you know the rules. Uh, and the speaker of the session before the coffee break are Petrecca, Sakis, and Gupta, Serafinelli, Sicilia, Singh, and Speranza. Remember to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Vincenzo Petrecca, a PhD student from Napoli, and I'm working in collaboration with the Observatory of Capodimonte on a project about the Asian variability and transient studies in the LSSD era. And for my project, I am working with different LSST science collaboration, uh, doing a light curve analysis, uh, trying to understand how to deal with the LST data products, and how to face the big data problem for time domain astronomy. And this not only for AGN, but for variable sources in general. However, as this is an AGN conference, I'm going to focus on AGN. And as the title of the conference is The Renaissance of Black Hole and Galaxies, then the title of my poster could not have been different from this. Getting ready for the Renaissance, because if it is a new survey approaching, such as the LSST, if it is also true that uh, we need to get ready for the survey, and this process, this process requires uh, uh, acquiring new uh, scales, uh, preparing uh, simulations, and developing new data analysis software, and exploiting all the available archival data. So, my poster is about uh, uh, the exploitation of SDSS data from the LSST AGN Data Challenge, which was introduced yesterday by Dragana Stolk. In particular, uh, the first part, uh, I explained the selection of AGN through optical variability, where we found that the correlation between different bands in the light curve could be a powerful ally to select sources through variability. And in the second part, we focus on, uh, uh, there is a, an ongoing work on the correlation between the variability amplitude and the physical properties of the sources, while in the uh, uh, last part, last but not least, we have preliminary work of testing of the LSST pipeline for the difference image analysis, which is a technique consisting of subtracting from all the images an older template image in order to see if there is something uh, which is radiating in the center of the galaxy. Uh, results are very promising for uh, weak AGN. Thank you for the attention. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Sacchi from uh, uh, University of Florence. And uh, uh, my poster is about uh, QSO's luminosity relation. You have already heard about it uh, um, this morning, so I will not uh, uh, introduce it, but uh, it was crucial mm, in those uh, talks uh, the fact that we have uh, a big sample of, uh, of QSO and that the relation is tight. So what we did was to um, perform fully um, spectroscopic analysis on, uh, on some data and we demonstrate that the intrinsic uh, dispersion is actually very low, as you can see. And uh, um, in order to improve the dimension of the catalog, we employed uh, Erosita data, which, uh, um, well, they, they do not uh, um, add much information, but they do behave well. So if you want details, come and have a chat and take a look at my poster. Hello. 
I'm Dhruva Jyoti Shengupto. I'm, I'm a PhD student uh, from University of Bologna. Here I have presented a poster on studying AGN obscuration using uh, Taurus models uh, with uh, broadband X-ray data. And uh, why X-ray? Because uh, the cosmic X-ray background contribution to uh, AGN is significant. And also obscured AGN has a significant contribution to, uh, to, to CXB. And the, uh, studying the uh, column density of uh, the cosmic, uh, of the obscured AGN, if it, if it is above 10 to the power 24 per, 20, uh, per centimeter square, then it is called a, a CT or a Compton thick AGN. Now, interestingly, uh, the, from the population synthesis models, it is found that the, in the local universe, that is where Z less than 0 0.1, the uh, population synthesis model predicts the, the fraction of CT AGN is 20 to 50 percent, whereas observationally the fraction is 5 to 10 percent. So to deal with this gap between observational model prediction, we update that we are trying to update the census, and that's where we come in. We have selected uh, uh, type 2 uh, AGNs, uh, Compton thick AGN candidates from Sweetbat catalog, and we have uh, which have archival newsstand data, and we have used uh, this beautiful donut-shaped torus uh, with physically motivated models, my torus and borus, on each of the sources. We have taken 55 sources. On each of the sources, we have used Chandra and XMM Newton data for energy band less than 10 kV and Neustar data for energy band greater than 10 kV. And we studied for each of the sources the typical signature of quantum of Compton thickness, like the line of sight coronal column density, covering factor, and, uh, and others. And finally, we find a very interesting result. We find that using new start data instead of sweet bat, the Compton thick AGN fraction is reduced to 49%. And the remaining 51%, which was previously said as a Compton thick AGN, actually shows Compton thin nature of cloud distribution. So if you are just like this emoji, if, if you are also very surprised and amazed to know how we have got this result to end what are our future prospects, you can check our, uh, our, my poster and our work of our research group. And I'm also available for discussion, always. Thank you. Hi. Roberto Serafinelli from EAPS, in EAPS in Rome. Uh, we have analyzed uh, the new star, uh, new new star spectra from uh, changing look at GN SO323 minus G77. Uh, changing look at GN are a GN that uh, undergo dramatic spectral variability uh, in many bands, in this case, uh, particularly in the X ray band. Uh, we have found uh, this, this source in a very obscure but Compton, thick, uh, obscure, Compton thin obscure state. There is uh, a limited uh, variability of the column density. And we also find, found two ionized uh, absorption regions, one outside the torus with low variability and low uh, ionization, and one inside the, the, the torus with higher ionization, with one observation particularly showing signs of uh, very uh, high velocity winds. And remarkably, uh, we also were able to constrain the temperature of the corona of the of the cipher galaxy is uh, around 35 kV. Thank you. Uh, many of you may not know me, not because this is. Um, my first conference or my first poster, but mostly because I forgot to put my name on everything I brought here. Um, so if you see a poster with any of these logos or this figure on it, that's my one, so I'm always happy to chat. Now, I'm Alex Achilia, last name's Italian, but my accent's British. Um, so that means, and I, I've been uh, studying at Trieste under Bid for Best with uh, Andrea Lappi and Lumen Bocco, who's here, who did the talk. And, um, that means one of two things. One, that I have given you a poster or presenting a poster that will take you through the, a possible route of um, looking at stellar mass black holes and producing them and turning them into supermassive black holes using dynamical friction as well as uh, without dynamical friction. But it also means if you want to, we can talk about what the best brand of tea is to drink. 
Either, either or, it is a coffee break, though I like to call it a tea break. So if you see this plot and you think to yourself, why is this data different, and you have any of these questions or any more questions, please come and see me in the break and we can discuss exactly what's going on when we're trying to make supermassive black holes all the way from stellar black, stellar black holes from the depths of stars to the giants that we see at the center of galaxies. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Basing. I'm a second year PhD student in the University of Trieste, currently at Chalmers University of Gothenburg. So as you might have heard a million times already about the problem of supermassive black holes, how they form. So here I present yet another model of how we can, we can create these massive black holes. So what we use are population three stars as seeds. And what we want is that these stars should grow as massive as possible so that when they collapse, they can be in the range of supermassive black holes. So we have two conditions which we want these stars to satisfy. First is that they should be isolated from other stars or sources so that there's minimum interference of feedback and everything. So these stars can keep on accreting more and more matter and grow as much massive as possible. The second is we can take advantage of the fact that these stars are being formed inside dark matter mini halos in the early universe. So if, if that's true, then if we consider the dark matter particles, if they are in the form of WIMPs, and if they're self-annihilating. Now, if that self-annihilation energy, if those particles are self-annihilating inside a star, so the star can then capture the energy, which can allow it to accrete more and more matter, and then they can become even more massive. So usually these population three stars are only as massive as 150 solar masses or 200, but if we consider these two conditions, then they can grow up to even 10 power five, so in the regime of supermassive black holes. Now, what I've done is I've tried to apply this on a cosmological simulation and try to see how many black holes can actually form via this mechanism. And we find that, okay, so one, uh, one interesting aspect of this is that we find that most of these black holes formed quite early in the universe, shown in the first figure. Where, we have, where I've showed a parameter called isolation distance, which is a, how, how much a star should be isolated from other stars when it's forming. So using that, we see most of the black holes formed quite early in the universe, at, even before redshift that equal to 20. And I've shown that in this poster that how we can actually use the Hubble Ultra Deep Field to try to actually constrain our model and even try to differentiate between different seeding mechanisms. So, for more details on that, you can check out the poster or talk with me. Thank you. Hi, all. I am, I am Giovanna Speranza. I am a PhD student from the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canaria. And I'm doing the PhD under the supervision of Cristina Ramos and Jose Costa and as part of the Bid for Best project. So my poster is uh, about the role of uh, agent feedback in an interacting type two quasar. And you can see the source on the optical image in the, in the left. And you can appreciate the well-extended uh, well tidal tail structure that is a clear signature of uh, a, a recent or past interaction. But uh, in my work, I focus in the center three arc second, uh, observed with the NIFS that, uh, uh, that provides us data cube in the near infrared band. So on the right, you can see uh, an example of the spectra where some of the mission line of the entire range are or show. Um, and the advantage of using the near infrared band is that uh, we can perform a multi-phase study of the gas because uh, molecular and ionized gas uh, are uh, observed simultaneously. So in my work fitted with multiple Gaussian spectra, I, I found that uh, uh, there is a, a very powerful ionized outflow in this source uh, that is uh, well aligned in the innermost part in the innermost part with the radio jet. So if you want to know more about uh, the property of the outflow and the gas kinematics of this source, please come to visit my, my poster and you will also find a nice picture of the voluntary isolation. Thank you for the attention. So let's thank all the speakers of this session. We reconvene at five, and for those who have the talk in the next session, remember to send it to me.
Thank mm-hmm. you.